uh, we're going to talk about the wilderness. Why the wilderness? And it's a, it's a tricky subject, uh, but it is a tool that God uses in our life to, I believe, prepare us for the promised land. If you're familiar with the Bible, you're familiar with the story of the Israelites. And God had a promised land for them that he was leading them to. And instead of taking 14 days, they took 40 days. Uh, but there's a way that God uses that. There's a seasons that we go through in life. The, the Bible says that there's a season for everything in life. And sometimes there are wilderness seasons in our life that each one of us go through. And so Joshua chapter 3 is a place that we launched on Sunday. And I want to recap. And again, I believe this is a picture of where we are as a church. I think it's an exciting time. I know for Beth and I that we believe that we are here. There's friends in, our, in, the, in the room that we have here. We believe some of our friends are in this place. Uh, but as a church, I even believe as a church in our nation that we are here. I just think that God is doing something amazing in the hearts of his people right now. We may not see it out here yet, uh, but what's been on my heart heavy over the last couple of months is just the internal work that is taking place with great anticipation and great excitement for what is to come out here because we can't recognize and realize the promise and the vision that God has for us outside until he has properly prepared and established us on the inside. So Joshua chapter 3, we're not going to read it again, but this is a, po- a moment where Israel is camped on the banks of the Jordan River. They have been in the wilderness for 40 years. This again, this is the 42nd place that they have camped. And so there's this incredible expectation of God leading them into something that they have been looking forward to for generations. There might be a dream, there might be a vision in your heart, there might be something that God placed in your heart, maybe that you forgot about that I'm going to believe tonight and in the coming days that he's going to remind you of, but there is something that you have been looking forward to for a very long time. There is a promise that you've been holding on to for a very long time, and you find yourself at the banks of the Jordan River, and God is getting ready to cross you over. I believe that is a word for us as a church, a word for us as our family, Um, and I, I, I I, I guess I speak that over you. I believe that God has that for us. And so they're sitting there on the banks of the river, waiting to come in. Great time of anticipation, expectancy for God. And I want to build that expectancy in you tonight that God truly does have something for us. Pastor Bill uh, has told us this is a year of revival, a, re- a year of deliverance, and a year of abundance. And I'm going to keep hammering that. I know we have grabbed a hold of that. And I believe that he wants to take us into the land of abundance. That's what God has for you. This is a moment where Joshua goes through the camp and he literally is telling them to break camp. Why is he doing this? For 40 years, Israel has been complacent. They have just been wandering. They've been circling the mountain. They've been repeating history at times uh, that God blesses them. They, he, they honor God at times that he challenges them. They harden their hearts towards God. And they're, just, they're, they're in this battle. They're in this struggle with the Lord. But they're complacent. And Joshua's coming in and he's saying, it's time to break camp. We're leaving from here. So he's getting them in an offensive position because they only travel a few miles. They travel about five miles to get to the banks of the Jordan from where they were, where they were camped in, uh, uh, in, in Shittim. And I know it's a funny word, but in the Hebrew, that's what it is. Um, and so they travel five miles, and they're right up against the banks. But then they have to sit there for three days. And that's when the spy goes into Jericho, and they find the, the, the lady's house. You guys know the story. I'm not going to go there tonight. But just there for three days. So they, they, he uproots them. He gets them out of a place of complacency, and he gets them in an offensive position. And this is what I pray tonight will be in your own heart, is that God wants to move us from a complacency and get us in that aggressive, get us in that offensive position to get ready and go seize that land that he has for us. This is the picture of where we start in the wilderness. But before we leave that wilderness again, I want to remind us and take us back to what does God want to us, for us to get out of the wilderness? How does he use the wilderness to prepare us for that promised land? I'm going to define again. I did this Sunday, but i got to do it again. What is the wilderness and what is not the wilderness? The wilderness is not sickness, disease, or poverty. It's nothing that, that God rescued us from. He does not teach us by sickness. That's not how he teaches us. We reject sickness. We reject poverty. He still provided for them in the wilderness. He still showed them the way in the wilderness. God is with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He loves you unconditionally. This is the heart of God. He is always with you. He does not teach us through sickness or disease. The wilderness can be a place, and and I don't know if we have the slates from Sunday, but that you don't feel like you're going anywhere. You're repeating history. Uh, You're frustrated. Things aren't working out. A little bit of progress. You're stuck in that same spot. There's a tension inside of you. It might be a wilderness inside of you where you're frustrated. You might be angry. Angry about the situation. We're questioning God. God, where are you? We can't see you. I can't see you working. I can't feel you. I don't understand what's going on. 
I feel like I'm confessing God's word. I'm speaking this. And we're still going nowhere. This is the signs. These are the types of things that describe where we are in the wilderness. You don't know where you are. You don't know where God is. This is a wilderness season. And a lot of times what the Israelites found in, in their wilderness is God was trying to lead them into a land where they had to go and fight giants. But they were so busy resisting the discomforts of life that they found themselves resisting God. I made that point on Sunday that sometimes in our own understanding, we don't recognize if we're resisting the enemy or we're resisting God. God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the humble. And I think this moment in Israel's history when God is leading them out of the promised land, they were immediately delivered from the, from the Egyptians. And sometimes immediate triumph can hinder our ability to understand that we have to fight sometimes to take the land that God has for us. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes we've got to fight to get the victory that we're after. That immediate triumph, setting them free from bondage, I think that weakened them to understand the difficulty they had to take on. Sometimes the comforts of the known will prohibit you from the abundance of the unknown. We get comfortable just knowing what we know. We get comfortable with what we have. Our brains naturally will reject something new. We don't like new. We don't like change naturally as humans. Our, that's how our brains operate. We reject those things. And so when God wants to do a new work in us, we find ourselves resisting him rather than running to the very thing that he's trying to draw us into. Because we don't like discomfort. We don't like pain. We don't like change. And sometimes it might hurt, but there's a difference between hurt and harm. God might have to take you through something that's going to hurt, but it's going to break something old off of you to be able to give you the new thing that he wants, but it will not harm you. This is not the nature of God. It's like my daughter Addison, she had a tooth that broke, and they, we had to go in, in the tennis the, the other day, and they had to pull that thing out, and now her tooth's growing in. She hated it. They had a gas, I mean, she freaks out on that kind of stuff. But she had to go through that painful process to be able to get the new tooth to come through. It can be a painful process. It may hurt, but it's not going to harm you. A victory is not always immediate. Ministry is not always extravagant. Sometimes we can't see God's hand just swooping over our life. And in a moment's time, we're rescued from the land of, of bondage and slavery. It takes time. Sometimes the fight isn't immediate. The victory isn't immediate. And there's a patient, the Bible calls it a patient endurance that develops that character, that develops that hope in us to be able to endure until we see the promise. It's not always immediate. We talked about how the, in the wilderness, it's not a season that God oftentimes is working on the outside. He's working on the inside. And I think in the last couple of days, God showed me some revelation. It's actually simultaneous. While he is preparing you on the inside, he is preparing what he is going to lead you into, in, into. And it's like a puzzle piece that comes together in his perfect timing. And it's beyond our understanding. It's beyond his timing. But make no mistake about it, in the wilderness, he's working on our heart. He's purging our heart. And then he's preparing the very thing that he has for you to walk into. And I, again, I believe that as a church. He's got something new out in the horizon for us, and he's preparing us. He's preparing your family. He's preparing your business. He's preparing us, and he's preparing the thing that he has for us. And it's going to be extravagant when it all comes together in his perfect timing. James 1, 12 says this, God blesses those who patiently enduring, endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love them. This pertains to our salvation, but it also pertains to life now. God came to give us life and life more abundantly. He prayed, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can have that right now. This crown of life that he talks about, sometimes there's a testing, there's a temptation season that goes through. But when you pass that, there's a new life, there's a new confidence, there's a new compassion that you find a new courage for you to be able to go in and do the very thing that God put in front of you to go and take. You receive the, cloud, the, the, the crown of life. Seasons of testing will tempt you to trust in something other than God. Jesus went through it. 
We talked about that on Sunday. The Holy, the, the Holy Spirit, after he was filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. He was tempted. He was tested. And then afterwards, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit because God does a deep work of building our trust in him and nothing else. So when we come out, we don't look to ever put our trust in something else because God loves you. He wants to walk with you in everything he's called you to do. We have to know who we trust in, not always what we trust in. I think for sometimes we forget about the person, and we quote, the, and I understand all the technical people are going to be like, well, Jesus is the word, okay? But a lot of times we'll quote a verse, but it's nice to shift our perspective every now and then and think about the person. Man, it's God. It's our creator. Man, I want to know who I trust in. I want to, Jeremy's, Pastor Jeremy's really big on the nature of God. Man, understanding who we are. And it's important to understand who he is in the context of this message. But know who you trust in, not just what you trust in. Just real quick, for those of you who weren't here, you can go back and listen to Sunday. I guess it was good. But the three points that I made, because I may not get to them tonight, are this. is The wilderness will purify your heart. And I'm going to come back to that. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Number two, it breaks us. And we discovered that breaking in the world is, is, is a negative. You know, we're broke. you got a broken neck heart, broken relationships. It's all negative. But brokenness in the kingdom is what God requires. Brokenness is not a place of defeat. It's a place of deliverance. Because once the core and the callousness of your heart is broken off, God begin, can begin to do a new thing in you. It empties us. When you're broken, you're empty. And honestly, this is the place we should live. If you're constantly empty... You're in a constant place where God can continue to fill you. We talked about the story out of 2 Kings, the lady who uh, husband's, her husband died and she had a debt to pay. She had a jar of oil, one jar of oil in her home. And the people were coming to collect that debt. She went to a man. She said, what should I do? He said, what do you have in your home? She goes, I got one jar of oil. He goes, okay, go to your neighbors, collect all the empty jars. Her and her sons go and do that. They come back and they continue to fill those empty jars. The point being, as long as you remain empty, the one the Holy Spirit will continue to fill you. Just pour your life out constantly. He will continue to fill you. The wilderness will purify your heart to break you. It leads you to a place of deliverance. It's not defeat. That's where God can do a new work. It empties us so God can fill us. Now that we got that out of the way, I want to go into a little bit more of what I'll talk to you tonight. So sorry, Nina, that you weren't here Sunday, but you have to listen to that message later because we're going to go somewhere else real quick. I am going to talk about Isaiah 48.10. It says this, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering or affliction. I will rescue you for my sake. Yes, for my own sake, I will not let my re reputation be tarnished. And I will not share my glory with idols. I forgot these two points in the 11 o'clock service. And I was like, I, you know, Pastor Bill's like, hey, just... What did you forget? I'm like, well, here's two things I forgot. In the nine o'clock, in the nine o'clock, I got it. But here's some questions I want us to hold on to, and I want to challenge you beyond tonight to keep these in front of you. What giants are trying to rule your heart? What issues in your own life, those things that maybe other people have brought up and you get defensive about, that you don't want to address, you're afraid to go into that territory, but they are ruling your heart and they are keeping you from the promised land. What giants are ruling your heart? What realities or insecurities in your own life are you afraid to address? It's another way of looking at rea certain realities, things that you're experiencing right now. It might be a mountain, relationship issues that you continue to have. You might want to start looking in internally. But these can become giants that are keeping us from the promised land. So again, we're talking about the wilderness of our heart right now. Your whole life might not be a wilderness, but there might be specific areas of your life that God wants to bring breakthrough that you are not willing to address. You want a victory, you got to be willing to fight for it. We talked about you can't have a victory without a battle. You got to be willing to fight. You got to be willing to address those things. We talked about the wilderness uh, gives us the character. When it purges our heart, all that nastiness stuff, that refinement that takes place, that gross nastiness surfaces in our heart, and God can skim that off. But not only does it give us the character to handle the promise, but it changes our identity. It changes our identity. 
I used an example uh, the other day, Abraham and, and Sarah. They were called Abram and Sarai. God gave them a promise of Isaac. They took matters in their own hands. They went outside the will of God and how he wanted to do it. Ishmael was born. It messed everything up. But 25 years went by before they received the, tw- the promise. 25 years of the wilderness. But in this moment where Abraham is broken and he's laying on the ground, the Bible said he's, he's on his knees before the Lord and he's crying out to God. He's in a place of brokenness. Now God can deliver him. And it's that place of brokenness that begin to change his identity. It's the very core of who Abraham was. God broke something off deep inside of Abraham, and, or Abram at the time, and he began to call him Abraham. He changed his identity. And then that's the moment where he became the father of many nations. He was not known for that in the past. I brought this orange because it was the best illustration I could come up with in really short notice. That... Uh, God will begin to break pieces off of our heart like this. And we think this is our heart. This outer edge is is what we see. This is all we see. And that brokenness, God begins to peel this off. And this is going a lot slower than I anticipated in my head. So talk amongst yourselves. (laughs) No. He breaks this off. But there's pieces of our heart that he begins to reveal to us that you didn't even know that were there. And this is what I'm believing God for. That in our brokenness, Abbott, that he begins to remind you, hey, here's a dream you forgot about. I'm going to give to you. Hey, you didn't think you had the ability to forgive? Well, I put a heart of compassion in you. Here's your ability to forgive. It's been buried underneath the calloused heart that we've had, but he's sending you through the wilderness to break you down. Now, I didn't think I was a person of vision. Oh, here's a vision that I put in your heart. He's going to begin to reveal different parts of your heart to you as he pulls back the layers. There's pieces of you that he put inside of you when you were formed in your mother's womb that you have no clue that are there yet. I'm telling you, there's an adventure coming to your life because God's going to begin to reveal things. I don't care how old you are in here. There is something new that God wants to do. He's going to pull back layers of our heart, and he's going to begin to reveal pieces of your heart you didn't know were there. He knows that number of hairs on your head. You don't. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's got something that he wants to do inside of us. We can't stay in the land that we've been in. You can't stay where you've been. It's time to break camp. It is time to move. It is time to ask yourself these questions. It is time to deal with the issues of our heart. It is time to move on. You cannot grab a hold of the new thing if you keep a hold of the old thing. What does God want to show you in your heart? There's different little pieces inside of there that you know nothing about yet. New dreams, new visions. And and 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 10, it says, In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Another translation says he will establish you. The wilderness establishes you. It lays that foundation in your life for you to be able to sustain the very thing that he's about to go and lead you into. He will restore that which was broken or that which was lost. A lot of times we think we lost something in the wilderness. He's going to support you and he's going to strengthen you. The process of purification is also messy, as you can see. Thank you for who's going to clean that up. It's messy. When we're going through that season where our hearts are being purged, man, things come up. I know it has in my, in my life. And I mean, Pastor Jeremy, some friends that are in the room here have been in rooms where they got to witness some of that. And it's messy. And there's a tension here that I want to talk about. We all go through it. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if you've ever been squeezed before, you've ever been in that moment where you're frustrated, you're in that wilderness and nothing's working out, and you get so mad, you're angry crying, you're cussing, you can't figure it out, things are coming out. 
Just that frustration, that purging, that squeezing is refining you. And it can be an ugly process. A couple months ago, I had the opportunity to preach on a Wednesday night. I preached a message called Make Room. It was pouring rain. And a lot of people here can go check it out, I guess, out in the podcast somewhere. But I talked about the story and how Jesus and Peter, how Peter denied Jesus. And Peter had this up and down lie. I mean, it was just this crazy. He was awesome in one moment. He's really bad in the next moment. He denies Jesus, but yet he's the same Peter that had the revelation that he was the Christ. Jesus gave him room to kind of work that stuff out in his life. But yet, James says our tongue is like the rudder on a ship. It directs the course of our life. That blessing and cursing cannot come out of our, our, our lives. This is why I think God leads us through the wilderness sometimes, is to help squeeze that out. But let's give each other room, understand where people are. We might go going through the wilderness. Give some room for that stuff to be worked out because that's not who they are. God's in the process of changing their identity and who he's called them to be. He called Simon to come follow him. At the revelation, he said, you are Peter. He called a vision out of his own heart and began to change his identity. Leave room for each other. But that process of what we get in our heart, that, that, that purity that comes out, is very important. So here's something of what we should do when we're in the wilderness. Sow good seed while you're in the wilderness. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. You sow good seed in the wilderness. Be careful with your heart. Yeah, there's going to be some things that comes out, but sow good seed. Galatians 6, 7 says this. Do not be misled. You cannot be mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. This applies to our finances, but it also applies to the words that we speak. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Choose life. What seeds are you sowing during your wilderness season? Sow the seeds that you want to live. What you're saying today, what you're confessing today, what you're speaking over your life today is shaping the world that you're going to live in tomorrow. Sow those seeds. God will not be mocked. Harvest time is coming. The Bible said there's seed, time, and harvest. Harvest is coming. And in the wilderness, it doesn't feel like it. In the wilderness, you just want to plant some seed. Because harvest is going to come. And you want to live that harvest that you want to see. So say those things. Speak those things. Be careful of the seed that you sow. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 says, rejoice in this, though you have suffered for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved, you have been distressed by various trials, that the genuine, genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. Here's my takeaway on that. Authentic faith is tested faith. God's going to test your faith in the wilderness, and he's going to create an authenticity in you. So when you leave there, there is beyond a shadow of a doubt you know where you stand. Because new levels are going to bring new problems. There's going to be, what is that saying, new levels, new devils? There's going to be another challenge. Heads up. There's going to be another storm. There's going to be another giant. And we go from glory to glory to glory. God's always about promoting us. So when you're in that wilderness season, man, get what you can. Sow the seed that you can. Get that faith tested. Get that faith purified. Get that heart ready. God's got something great on the other side of it for you. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those spirits that are crushed. Matthew 5, 3, God blesses those who are poor, broken, and realize their need for him. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A lot of us have been living in a life where we've just been camped out in that wilderness. And again, tonight I'm going to invite people, let's break camp. Let's leave. It's time to move on. There's a famous uh, quote, and I might butcher this because I'm going to shoot this off in memory. But the pain of, st- and you, you won't make a change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And I just want to challenge you, and I want to encourage you tonight. Man, let's break camp. Wherever you are, that place of complacency. Let's move out of the wilderness and let's go to the promised land. It's time to move. It's time to change. There's a new work. There's a new season that's coming. There's a new era. You can't put new wine in old wineskin. 
God wants to do a new thing. He's starting to break up the soil of our heart, and he's revealing new things to us because he's calling us into new territory, calling us into new seasons. But let's understand what happened in the wilderness before we leave. Let's grasp this. Preparation for the promise. That's the wilderness. It prepares us for what God has out in front of us.